Ezekiel chapter 8. Now I have titled this, um, this particular teaching, Lift Your Eyes to the North. And I find this very interesting. We're going to dig into some really heavy stuff in this chapter. It's been very, it's, we've had some pretty full on sessions so far, haven't we? But this is, um, this is really heavy stuff. And at first reading of the text does not really scratch the surface of how serious what these Israelites and what these Jews in particular were doing and how abominable it is. So the the beginning, like the chapter in my Bible says abominations in the temple, and we're going to be looking at that. But I really want to um, prophetically look at lifting our eyes to the north because the Lord has been really highlighting this for me lately. It's a prophetic person. Lifting our eyes to the north, what does that mean? I think that that is our solution as the remnant of those of us who will be saved from judgment to come and from what's actually happening on this earth right now. We are the remnant, and I think that the keys that we're looking for are found in Scripture. So are we ready to go? You guys hit the share button. Okay, Samuel says he's getting me clearly. That's wonderful. Praise God. All right, let's flip over to the notes. We're going to start with some background info. And here is the overarching question I have for you today. As you know, with these studies, we get really personal with this stuff. Even though this is in the context of what happened to Israel and the southern kingdom and all of Israel, Ezekiel was a prophet for all of Israel, um, we need to ask about what is God saying to us today from the text. Excuse me. So here is my question I have for you to ponder on today's teaching. What are we beholding? What are we beholding? This is such a word for now. All right, let's start with our background info. So chapters 8 to 11 that we're moving into now cover the complete captivity of Jerusalem and Israel. Remember, Israel uh, was already taken captive like 180 years earlier by Assyria. They're already in captivity. The Assyrians have been conquered by the Babylonians, so they're now in captivity by Babylon as well. And now Jerusalem is about to be completely demolished. So this is, this is taking us from prophecy to reality. And here's another significant thing that happens during chapters 8 to 11. The glory of the Lord departs the temple and it doesn't return, guys. It does not return. Um, this is technically the end of the, of the theocratic kingdom in Israel. This is a hugely significant event. It never returns. Even when long after they return to the land, and if you know much about Israel's history, a lot of it can be read in the Deuterocanonical or Apocryphal text, text particularly 1st, 2nd, and I believe 3rd Maccabees, in the Maccabean Revolt, where they reinstituted the kingdom and they reinstituted Hasmonean kings. Now, Hasmonean kings were not from the line of Judah. They were not, they, they were not technically proper kings. And that led to the King Herods and all the rest of it. They were Hasmonean kings. But the theocratic kingdom that God set up and promised to David would be an eternal kingdom was now cut from this point onwards. And of course, Jesus is both the, both the root and the fruit of Jesse. So Jesus is the king. And the kings they set up much later on were not, were not the kings. They were not the kings. Now, as we're going along, as I said to you guys, I can't really um, follow up with questions as we go. I want a nice um straight set of teaching but if you've got questions leave them in the comment section and I will get to them at a, at, a, at a later date so this is really significant all right now in chapters one and three of the book Ezekiel received his vision from God which we covered chapters four and five he acted out those those um, four signs that were really odd chapter six and seven which we've just covered in recent weeks uh, were the two messages that were given about the signs to explain these really odd things these charades he was doing in, in a public place and now he has a new vision from God. And this is quite significant. This is where we're starting in chapter 8. Now, chapter 8, um, in terms of the chronology, takes place about a year after the signs and messages that he gave. So chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, it's about a year after that time. And what it concerns is the sin of the people back, actually back in Jerusalem. Remember, Ezekiel is on the river Kibar as an agricultural slave. And he is getting visions of what's going on back in Jerusalem prior to that final siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the glory, um, the glory appeared again to Ezekiel. That's why he saw the glory. It appeared again, and it actually took the prophet in a vision to the holy city. That's we'll read about that in verse two. 
Now, here's a big question. Was he physically taken there or was it a vision? Scholars do debate this. And at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters. <laughs> the message was conveyed. Now, he actually saw a fourfold view of the sins of the people when he was taken in this vision to Jerusalem. So in verse 5, he sees the image set up at the north gate of the temple, which is possibly uh, the goddess Astarte, uh, which is a foul Babylonian goddess. We're going to get more into what, how disgusting that actually is as we dig deeper into this text. Um, he also saw in verses 6 to 12, secret heathen worship in the hidden chambers of the temple actually being conducted by the priests in their hidden chambers. In verses 13 to 14, he saw Jewish women weeping for the god Adonis, who was supposed to die and be raised from the dead each spring. So it was a complete idol worship, but there's a lot more to it, guys. As we dig into the text, you're going to see there was a lot more happening. And in verses 15 to 16, he sees the high priest and 24 other priests actually worshipping the sun. Now, I'm deeply grieved about diving into this stuff because even though we don't perform these sort of practices today, I mean, the Hindu religion would, um, well, let's not go there. I mean, gosh, I could go and rip apart yoga, I suppose, if I really wanted to. Um, but this is significant. This matters. How are we How are we doing these kinds of things today? How are what we're doing today equally as offensive in the eyes of God? We really need to ask ourselves that because it's pretty important. Okay, who's ready to read the text? I'm reading from the New King James Version. We're picking up in verse 1. Are you ready? We're going to be talking about the abominations and what they mean. All right, verse 1 says, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. That's what I said. He, he, was, at, he was still at the river Kibar and he had this vision. So the hand of the Lord God, This, as, as I said to you before, this vision is dated, it's actually 14 months after Ezekiel's call in chapters 1 verses 1 and 2, where he was by the river Kiba and he saw visions of the throne of God. So he was, um, the hand of the Lord comes upon him really strongly. Uh, what most scholars believe has happened is he's entered into a trance state as he did in chapter 1 verse 3 and in chapter 11 verse 5 he's gone into a trance which really means uh, I look there's plenty of biblical precedences for trances but in terms of how the bible describes them like uh, Peter had a trance um, I'm just trying to think of others that fell, in, fell into trances um, I mean, even Adam fell into a deep sleep and and you know the, the rib was removed from him the, the trance is essentially where you're physically still in the place where you physically are, but your spirit is actually translated or removed. Like, is it translated or are you just seeing a vision? It's hard to say. Who knows? These things are mysteries. But he was taken to another place and he was taken to Jerusalem. He was taken to actually view what was happening in the temple in Jerusalem. All right, let's move to verse 2. And it says... Um, Excuse me, I'm just checking as we go along. Verse 2. Then I looked and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire from the appearance of his waist and downward fire and from his waist and upward like the appearance of brightness like the colour of amber. Let's discuss this appearance of fire. This is similar to chapter 1, uh, but the word fire is actually debated amongst scholars. Now, the LXX, that's the, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament written for all the Hellenistic Jews, the Jews um, that returned to the land that were mostly Greek-speaking after Alexander the Great took over the known world. So they couldn't read the, the Hebrew text, and it was translated into Greek. That's the LXX or the Septuagint, if you see that. Now, um, the Septuagint actually renders this verse in this passage. It says the appearance of a man rather than fire. So the f word fire comes more from the Masoretic text, which is the, which is the original text. That's the Hebrew text that, that was alongside and contemporary with the, um, with the LXX or the Septuagint. So the, the Masoretic text translates it as the appearance of fire. But the Septuagint translates it as the appearance of a man. And most scholars agree that man is a better translation there. From chapters 1, verse 26 and 27, when he had the visions of, of the throne and he saw God like a man. Now, this vision that, that, that Ezekiel is having here is the basis for the glory of God vision in 
in, in Ezekiel that he sees right throughout the book, but also in the book of Revelation when John is seeing the glory of God. So uh, man is probably a better translation there, all right? Are we going? This is good commentary, right? Hmm. Excuse me. Just so that you know, I got a lot of the commentary from the brilliant scholar Dr. Chuck Missler and the, um, the prophetic insights that come from me, which we get to at the end. All right, verse 3. Let's keep reading verse 3. He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. I wrote a prophetic word on this last year. I can't remember what it was, but there was something really significant about this verse for right now, right now in our current day. Let's dig into this. First things first, he was picked up by a lock of his hair. Why is this significant? Because in chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, he had shaven his head, remember, which was a shame for a Jewish man to do, for, for any Israelite to do. Shaving of the head is deep mourning. So his hair had obviously grown back to some stage, which demonstrates that, yes, this was a period of time after what we've already studied so far. Now, him moving to and seeing Jerusalem, was it a vision? Was he being translated as Philip was translated in the book of Acts from one place you know, to, in Samaria to, you know, to meet the Ethiopian on the road and then was translated back again? Was he transported to heaven as Paul talks about in the third person about knowing a man that whether he was in or the body or out of the body he didn't know or when John saw um, the throne of God and he was taken up to heaven? Was he transported to heaven? We really don't know, but something obviously supernatural was going on. And we are t clearly told that these were visions. Uh, majority of scholarship believe that this was a vision rather than him physically being taken to Jerusalem. But hey, it's not about, like God could definitely have done that. He could have physically taken him to Jerusalem. Verses three, um, there's a few other cross references that you can have a look at, tend to indicate this was a vision. Now, um, this is probably what would be referred to as a kind of second sight and not necessarily physical levitations as in being carried up and him being sort of suspended over the, you know, like some ghostly figure over the, um, over the city of Jerusalem. So it's more likely that he was having a vision, you know, seeing, these things are hard to explain, right? They're mysteries. Can we be comfortable with the mystery for now? All right, um, there are a number of cross-reference passages which you can look at. If you want to go deeper, I really highly recommend you go into the discussion section and download the notes. All right, um, now these visions, these being caught up into visions, are not at all unique to Ezekiel. There are a number of um, examples in the Bible. Elijah in 1 Kings 2 was caught up in a vision. I already talked about Philip in the New Test Testament. Actually, let's read that, Acts 8, 39. I love this story where Philip was translated, literally taken physically from one place to another. I'm, I'm open for you to do that to me, Lord. That sounds like fun. Don't need a passport. I can just go wherever you need to send me and then I can go back when I'm done with my assignment. Does anyone else want physical translation? Does that sound like an adventure with God? Okay, Acts 8.39 says, Now when they came up out of the water, so he baptized this Egyptian, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. Uh, it's amazing. So it did happen. It happened to Paul as well. Let's read about that too in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. This is where Paul refers to himself in the third person. You know, because he's humble and he's not wanting to glory in the in the in the experience because he knew that the Corinthian church were very big on supernatural manifestations, but not so great on character and morality. So Second Corinthians twelve verses one to three says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who fourteen years ago, whether in the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. Okay, so we don't, you don't really know, but there was something mysterious going on. It's believed by scholarship that this happened to him after he was stoned in Lystra in the Galatian country. And, you know, people think, yeah, it, it, it's, it's believed that Paul actually did die there and was resurrected back to life. So while he died, he was caught up to heaven and he saw the things that he couldn't, he, he couldn't explain, but it's pretty amazing. And then think about Revelation chapter 4 where John is caught up to the third heaven as well and sees visions of the throne and writes all about it. It's pretty amazing. 
Now, I want to talk in this verse, in verse 3, there's a few things. So it was the door to the uh, the door of the north gate of the inner court. I want to spend a bit of time here. This is important um, to understand the structure of the temple at the time and, and why this was so significant. All right? We can miss this in a light reading of the text. That's why we want to go deeper. Now, the inner court was the temple court proper, and there's a few different verses that you can cross-reference to look at that if you want to go deeper. So the inner court was the proper court of the temple. The middle court was on a lower level, and it contained the palace of the king. And you can read about that in some passages in First and Second Kings. Now, there was yet a lower level, which was the great court or the outer court, and this enclosed the entire palace complex. Um, there are some more cross-reference passages in um, Ezekiel and in 1 Kings to read about that. Now, here's the interesting thing. In ancient temples, the gateway was a covered building entered by means of an entrance or a door. So the door of the north gate of the inner court, is this is what it was. It was entrance into this the, the, the temple proper. Does that make sense? All right. Um, another really important thing I want to pick up in verse 3. As I said, verse 3 is significant. I had this in a prophetic word. I can't remember. I'll have to go back and look at my blog. Um, but I had this in a prophetic word last year. It's, this is really significant for now. Let's look at the term image of, or the phrase image of jealousy because this is really important to us. Now, what they believe this could have been was an idol that was set up by Manasseh. Manasseh was a son of Hezekiah. And then from there, so Hezekiah had set up reforms to remove idol worship. Manasseh came after him, was probably the most wicked king of the southern kingdom. And then after Manasseh, there was Josiah who, who, who turned around and destroyed Manasseh's work as best he could and reinstituted godly worship in the temple. So it's believed that Manasseh put this idol in the temple during his reign. You can read about it in 2 Kings 21 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Um, now, this was both abomination and a blasphemy against God. Now, when it's saying an image of jealousy, it's not talking about jealousy itself, but something which provokes to jealousy. Let's look. There's a number of cross-reference passages in the notes, but I want to turn to Deuteronomy 32, chapter 21. And this will explain why this was something that was so provocative for God. Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. All right, we must almost be there. Okay, they have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols, but I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. And that certainly was Babylon if you look at what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what was happening. They were provoking God by putting this idol right at the tem uh, temple court opening. Let's go deeper. What was this idol? Now, scholars believe it was an image of Asherah, who was the mother goddess of the Canaanites. Let's read this in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 7. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 7. When you really look at and, and really dive into this, this, this made me cry. I'm going to be honest. It was emotional reading this, what, what they did. We can read over this and skip over it and not catch the significance of what was happening. Now, this, I believe, is talking about Manasseh. Yes, it is. Manasseh reigns in Judah. Very, very naughty man. Um, Deuteronomy, sorry, 2 Kings 21 verse 7 says, He even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of, of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And he put it there. It was an idol to Asherah. We got to go further because Asherah, the worship of Asherah was abominable. All right. Now, Josiah, thankfully, and I do believe this stopped this judgment coming against Judah sooner. Josiah destroyed it. If we stay in 2 Kings and move to chapter 23, verse 6, we see what Josiah did to destroy this. It says, and he brought out the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem, burned it at the brook Kidron and ground it to ashes and threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. Remember, because because bones, we talked about this in the, in the last lesson, bones of the dead are defiling. So it's a way of defiling um, what is a, a clear abomination to the Lord. 
All right, now let's talk a bit about Asher. Asher could also be Astarte. They're both considered the same goddesses, just represented in different different places. The Hebrew word for Astarte or Asherah is actually grove, but it ought to be translated. So it's 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 it looks like it's a, a um, the way it translates in the text is it looks like a grove or a tree or a statue, but in in all honesty, it actually looked like a phallic symbol of pagan idolatry. Now, for anyone who needs me to look, I used to be a science teacher. I've got no shame in talking about this. If you don't know what phallic imagery is, we are talking about the image of male anatomy, male sexual organs. Are we clear on that? It's pretty disgusting, right? In the temple of the North Gate leading into the temple of the Mo- where the worship of the Most High God takes place. So this is serious. Um, Second Kings 21, did we read that? No, 21 verse 3. This is also talking about what Manasseh did says, for he re- rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a woman, w- wooden image as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. So this is really, really serious. Um, so in addition to Asherah, we're talking about um, the Syrian god Venus, who was worshipped, so was Asherah, with very licentious rites. She was called um, the Queen of Heaven. She was the wife of the Phoenician goddess, uh, the Phoenician god, rather Baal. So Asherah was the was the wife of Baal, um, who essentially represents Satan. And women, the the worship was not just idol worship. We're talking about. We're going to get to into it deeper. We're talking about child sacrifice, and we are talking about very licentious sexual immorality around the Asherah pole and this was happening in the temple do you get a picture of why God was so upset this is serious guys all right let's go back to our reading of the text verse four we're up to now excuse me I need to pick this up okay verse four and behold the glory of God the glory of the God of Israel was there like the vision that I saw in the plain now in the plain implies that he's still actually at Kibar all right, the, the, as I said, there's argument as to whether he was physically taken to Jerusalem. I think this tends to imply that he's still at, P- at Kibar. But what's happening here is we're about to see the departure of the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. Chapters 8 to 10, we will see the gradual withdrawal of the glory of the Lord from the temple and Israel. This is a massive deal, guys. It does not come back. Okay, it's now poured out on us. Hallelujah. So the glory lifted from the temple and went out over the city to the east and actually hovered there. It's like the spirit brooding. Uh, it won't be until chapter 11 that we'll see the final departure of the glory. Gosh, we're all going to be a bit emotional by the time we get there. I know I will be. Okay, let's pick up in verse 5. Verse 5 says, Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north and there north of the altar gate was this image of jealousy in the entrance. So this toward the north and I, this is, I'll be giving you some prophetic insights into this at the end of this. The northern gate was the most frequently used one for the palace buildings. Uh, so uh, so the pa- only people who were in the palace would, would enter the temple via the, um, by the southern or the eastern gate. But the majority of people entering the temple would, would have used the northern gate. So it is the most... Uh, likely entrance into the temple. Does that make sense? Let's keep reading in verse 6. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, you will see greater abominations. All right, let's look at these abominations. They were causing Yahweh, Yahweh, however you want to say his name, Yehovah, it's, none of us know how to say it. Okay, let's agree on that. It was causing him to withdraw from his sanctuary. That is deeply grieving. There are some cross-reference passages I don't have time to go in on, but you can dive deeper if you really want to. All right, let's read verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8. Okay, um, so he brought me to the door of of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall, and when I dug into the wall, there was a door. Wow, there was a door. What's he talking about here? There was an aperture in the wall of the priest's hidden chambers. We are talking about access to seeing something that the priests were trying to hide from God. And what do we know? 
nothing is hidden from the Lord. Their hidden idolatries could be seen by the Lord, and now he showed them to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet, and he was about to expose it. All right, let's pick up verses 9 and 10. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there every sort of creeping thing, this makes me feel sick to my stomach, abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around the walls. Yuck. The word portrayed here literally means that they were carved or incised, in, like they literally got and carved these abominable creatures which would have included creatures that had, like, we're talking really serious sexual immorality. It would have been serpents, would have just disgusting, creeping things on the walls of the inner chamber of the temple of the Most High God. Yuck. Um, I want to read Ezekiel 23, 14, which addresses this again, just briefly. Give me a moment. Uh, okay. But she increased her harlotry. She looked at men portrayed on the wall. Images of Chaldeans, that's um, Babylonians, portrayed um, uh, portrayed in vermilion, like in bright colour. So I would not be surprised if carved onto the wall were, were highly immoral sexual acts in bright colour. Like just, I feel sick talking about it. I feel sick. So the walls were covered with with these idols or these icons and the people were worshipping the creature rather than the creator. Now think about this. In um, in Egypt, the, in Exodus, nine plagues came, there were ten in total, but nine of the plagues that came against Egypt were actually specifically against each of the gods that they were worshipping. Now in Romans 1, 21 and 25, I won't read, but that is the most... And I'm going to say something controversial here, but it, it needs to be said. Um, Romans one, the, uh, Romans one, is the most condemning passage that people who are more liberal Christians, progressive Christians, and try to find a way to, um, they find a way to. Uh, Lord, give me the words to speak, Holy Spirit. Uh, they find a way to tell people who are living in a sexually immoral lifestyle that sex outside of marriage that God ordained, including homosexuality outside of, you know, it's, let's be clear about that, okay? Let's be clear. It is an abomination. In Romans 1, that is the most condemning passage. I know many, um, you know, homosexual activists and apologists who are in the progressive church are trying to say, oh, you know, Leviticus says this, but the New Testament says this. There's no way around it in Romans chapter 1. It is the most condemning passage in all of the scripture. And here's the thing. In Romans 1, we read that this is a specific judgment pronounced upon those who fail to represent God as creator. This is fundamental, guys. When I saw this, my heart broke. I have to speak out about at this more often and this is hard and I'm asking Holy Spirit strengthen me and give me help the judgment for rejecting for the judgment this is so hard to say share this I'm going to get in trouble so what the judgment for rejecting God as creator and worshiping creature over crea and creation over creator is actually homosexuality can you believe this can you believe it I am shocked the Lord turns them, that's what it says in Romans 1, because they rejected me, like they're without excuse. Romans 1 says we are without excuse. God's glory is revealed in creation. If we reject it, we are turned over to these sorts of things. It is a judgment. Now, I'm not talking about someone who's struggling with their sexuality and you're in the church. God loves you. I'm not saying you're not saved. That, you know, there is grace for you. But those who willfully turn away and, and willfully thumb their nose at God, and say, I'm going to live how I want to live, and you can't tell me how to live. The judgment is in your body. Wow, sexual immorality is a sin against our own bodies, and I'm not coming to you from a high place, okay? I am someone who has committed sin in the past. Praise God, I am forgiven, and he no longer remembers my sin. But I'm telling you now that this is a judge. Sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Wow, Israel has now sunk to the level of the nations around her. But let's pick up in verse 11. I've got to get a moving. I've got a class to teach at 11. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Je Je Jezaniah, I don't know how to say his name, the son of Shaphan, 
Each man had a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. Now, it's, Jezaniah is meant to be a well-known man. His father, Shaphan, had possibly assisted Josiah in reform. If you want to read that, you, there's cross-reference passages I don't have time to go into. You can read about what Shaphan did. Shaphan helped J Josiah destroy um, the idols, but now his son is now doing the exact opposite and has now greatly corrupted the faith of his family. This is tragic, guys. This is tragic. This is why they were judged so harshly. Verse 12, let's read on. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols, for they say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken this land. I, I want to look at the term every man in the room of his idols. Here's the thing. God is watching. They're worshipping in their secret chambers, but they're not hidden from God. Nothing we do is hidden from the Lord. All right, let's move on to verses 13 and 14. And he said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations. Can you believe it gets worse? That they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Now Tammuz uh, is believed to be the miraculously born son of Semir Semiramis. I don't, know who, I, I don't know how to pronounce that. She was the queen of the wife of Nimrod. Nimrod, remember Tower of Babel, the first world di dictator who was a Chaldean. So we're talking about a Babylonian. So she was a miraculously born son of, son of him. And in Sumerian culture, um, he's believed to be the D Dumuzi, I don't know how to say this, check the notes, Dumuzi god of spring vegetation. And what the story was, was that he died at winter solstice, went down into the netherworld to be resurrected again. And it was similar to the Egyptian Osiris, the Canaanite Baal, and the Syrian Adonis. These women were weeping, celebrating the death of this god, um, so that he would be resurrected again. And it was a worship of nature. Once again, they are worshipping the cre cre creation rather than the creator. And then what happened? It was connected with vile and immor immoral ceremonies, human sacrifice. People were sacrificed, okay? And sexual union formed part of various cult rites. This is what was happening in the temple. Oh, my goodness. I mean, when I saw this, when I saw what this really meant, of course, these are abominations. Our heart should hurt. Mine does. Let's read verses 15 and 16. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. Oh my gosh, I need a bucket. Uh, so he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and there at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord like they're back to God, oh my gosh, and their faces toward the east and they were worshipping the sun toward the east. Oh, Lord, give us strength. 25 men. This, These were 24 leaders of the classes of priests. You can read about that in First Chronicles 24, verses 5 onwards. And it was also the high priest. The high priest and 24 leaders of the priesthood were worshipping the sun towards the east. Of all of the abominations, this is the greatest. Why? Like the worship of the sun is the greatest abomination and especially by those who were the leaders and the elders in Israel. I want to read a quick cross-reference passage from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19, which condemns worship of the sun and how abominable it actually is. Anyone practicing yoga and doing sun salutations? I'm just going to tell you right now, you are worshiping the sun. Stop it. Um, I don't care how unpopular that makes me. Uh, if, if you like to do that, this is not the page for you. Go follow somebody else. I'm not apologizing for that. Um, Deuteronomy 4 verse 19 says, um, And take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, that's what Manasseh was worshipping, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. They're our, they actually, why are we worshipping something that's been given to us to serve us? That's what God's saying. You're serving, you're serving and worshipping something I've given to you as your own inheritance and heritage. It's wickedness, all right? Yeah, it's wickedness. Okay, verse 17. And he said to me, have you seen this? O son of man, is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. 
Then they have ret returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Now, what does it mean to put the branch to their nose? Jewish commentators of the past have said that this speaks of shocking and degrading religious rites. Like it's like something, re what we would say in Western culture, something that's on the nose. Like it is off, what we'd say here in Australia, off like a bucket of prawns. Like really, really abominable and bad. And and if you've smelt prawns, or Americans would call them shrimp, that have gone off, it's literally one of the worst smells in the world. That's 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 what God's saying. This is how serious this is. All right, are we hanging in there, guys? I know this is full on. I know I've said some strong things. Pray about it, hey? Don't just take everything I say. Pray about it. Ask the Lord what he's saying to you. All right, we're nearly at there, and then we get into our modern application. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to do some business with God again. All right, verse 18. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ear, ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Israel has stepped so far over the line that God said, no, I'm done. I'm done. That's it. I'm done. They can, no, they can go no lower than this. They have hit rock bottom. And God will now judge them in his fury, as we're going to read about more in coming chapters. All right. Pretty heavy stuff, right? So thank you guys who have stayed to the end. It's pretty heavy stuff. Uh, Elisa has said she agrees. Yes, I know I'm, I, I'm not meaning to be harsh. Please hear my heart. I'm not meaning to be harsh. Are there people that practice Christian yoga and can do some stretches? Probably. Uh, look, I wouldn't do it. Um, but there are certain things that are designed. If you look in them, those poses are done to worship Hindu gods. And sun salutations is one of them. So um, please pray about it with the Lord and let the Holy Spirit convict you. Spirit of truth, spirit of wisdom, come now and bring conviction. I don't want anyone to feel condemned, okay? I have done things. I have done yoga. I've had to repent. I have committed sexual immorality in my past. I have had to repent. God forgives. I want you to be very clear on that. Hear my heart. Hear this from a pastoral perspective. My heart is to see you whole walking in your freedom, walking in your God-given identity. So please do not feel condemned, but allow the Holy Spirit to convict your heart because he has given you freedom. He's given you freedom. He's given you freedom. All right, here are my prophetic insights from this chapter for us today. We must remember that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? So all of this stuff was happening in the temple where the glory dwelt. But we are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. So Holy Spirit, convict us now of what's in our minds and what's in our hearts. It does not belong. Anything sitting on the throne of our hearts that we have to consult. I've said this before. We have to consult before we, we say yes to God. It has to go. We have to repent. Now, I have been, and this is a word I released this, in my, in, not in my church, the church I attend and serve. On Sunday night, as a prophetic word, I released a little bit in my in my praying group. If you're following my Let's Pray um, public prayer group, I have been hearing the song over and over again in my spirit for the last two weeks. Um, oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above, and he's looking down with love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. And if you know that Sunday school song, it goes on to say, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little feet, where you go. And I had an extra one for my daughter last week. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. And you know what? We're still God's little children. Remember John, the Apostle John addresses us as ye, ye are of God, little children. So we're still his kids. And we need to be careful what our ears are hearing, what our eyes are seeing, where our feet are going and what we're saying from our mouths. This is a season to really allow the Holy Spirit to convict us. Most importantly, we do not need to be hearing the lies of the enemy. We do not need to be hearing condemnation right now. We need to be hearing that if we are struggling, let me say this. The Lord is restoring purity in this hour, especially for many of you who have had your purity stolen from you at a young age but as a child by an illegal and heinous manoeuvre. I see over you right now, and I was emotional sharing this with, with, with my church on Sunday night, 
I see the love of the Father. If you're struggling with sexual purity, if you're struggling with purity in your ethics, I want to assure you now that God is restoring that. If you bring it to him, you say, Lord, just help me. Help me. He is here to help with the outstretched loving arms of a father to love you into a place of wholeness and purity because the Lord is returning for a bride without spot or wrinkle and she will be glorious, okay? So I want you to know that hear my heart. This is not condemnation. This is love for you from your heavenly father. Allow the Holy Spirit to convict, bring it to him and he is the one that's restoring your purity in Jesus' name. And finally, I want to encourage you to lift your eyes to the north. That's what I've called this whole this whole session. Lift your eyes to the north. And now the north um, represents a whole host of things, but I feel specifically for us, it's getting our eyes back on true north, getting our eyes back on him. When we are finding ourselves struggling with purity, we shouldn't be hiding in shame. We should turn our faces towards him and say, Daddy, help. I need a father's help. Give us help from trouble, Lord, like a father's help. We need a father's help. And that's what we're going to pray. Let's move into prayer, position yourself to receive, and then I have to close out for my next teaching. Father, we cry out to you right now for a father's help. Oh, God, I just feel feel your compassion for those who have had their purity stolen by an act that they did not invite. Lord, I thank you that you are restoring purity to those who are crying out for purity. Right now, you are restoring purity in Jesus' mighty name. Just confess those things to the Father. Find yourself a, a, a pastor you can confess to, a, a, you know, a trusted person, because the Bible does say, confess your sins to God so you can be forgiven. Confess your sins one to another so you can be healed. There'll be healing when you talk to someone trusted. You don't need to blurt it all over the internet. This is private. Uh, that you can talk to about, hey, I'm struggling with this in my purity. And it may not just be sexual purity. It may be about, it could be about cheating on taxes or not declare. Like we're called to purity in all things. So Father, through your Holy Spirit, convict us. We need a Father's help right now. We just lay this all down for you to heal us from any impurity that does not belong to our sinless, spotless nature in Christ Jesus. We declare we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and we step into your purity by faith in Jesus' name. And lead us and give us wisdom, Father, to who to confess to that we may be healed. And some of you may need counseling, trauma counseling. I just encourage you that the Lord is doing a great work in our hearts right now. He's doing a work in me. Okay, I'm not coming to you as someone who has it all together. I'm coming to you as someone who has been broken and the Lord is healed and restored. Um, I, I just want you to know I love you guys. I love you guys. Okay, if you're struggling with same-sex attraction, I love you. God loves you. He is for you. He is not against you. Bring it to him and let him give you a father's help. Let's turn our eyes towards the north. Father, we, we turn our eyes towards the north. Get our eyes off the circumstances and shift them to our true north, which is you. We behold you, Jesus, because as we behold you, you are our mirror. As he is, as you are Jesus, 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are we in this world. As we behold you, as in a mirror, 2 Peter um, 1, 2 Peter 1, particularly verse 3, if we look in the mirror, everything we need pertaining to righteousness and godliness is already within us. So what do we do? We just continue to behold the mirror. We continue to behold you, Jesus. And as we do, you are transforming us into your image. And I thank you, God, that you are doing this through the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. And all of God's people said, amen. All right. Thanks for listening.